Hi, this is Dr. Scott Young, and we're here with Jeremy Whaley and of, of TradeMaestro.com. And so we're going to talk a lot about banking, the value of gold, money supply, coming right up. Okay, so first off, I did want to kind of share, um, I have a cool patriot. Over my shoulder over there, you're going to see a little candle. And she just sent it to me um, just, just out of the night, kindness of her heart. And she's at candleenvy.com, and you can kind of check her out. She's got cool st cool candles, just a nice lady that, that kind of sent it to me. So just found me on the TikTok that has been happening too. So, hey, man, how's it going? Doing good. How are you? All right. So we were talking a little bit about some of the ideas of money supply, and you have some cool charts today. So I think it's going to be kind of fun to kind of get into with that. So talk to me a little bit about what was happening in your life here uh, the last couple of days. Oh, I can't, I can't even recap the last couple of days, but oh, yeah. what we were talking about before we started here was uh, I have a client over in Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates, that I've been coaching for the last year or more on crypto trading. And today we were having a conversation on fiat, and somehow we landed down this road and I ended up pulling up all these charts. And I said, I'm talking to Scott tonight. I bet these would be good to share. So I left them all pulled up and uh, I can't even quite remember what conversation I had with him now, but I think I can somewhat approximate it. And I thought I would share some of that with us. Yeah. So was he very awakened or he was just kind of on the edge? You know, that's a great question. Um, it's been a fascinating experience. Uh, religiously, we have different beliefs, but he's just a wonderful man. Um, politically, ironically, um, he's very much aligned. In fact, he says that most of the Middle East is aligned. He said they hate our wow. current uh, administration, said that they absolutely love the Trump administration, said the best uh, best time in the last 20 years for the Middle East was under Trump. Amazing. And um, he said that is a general sentiment across the board. However, they're, you know, he's, they're pro-jabs and they believe kind of all the COVID narrative, but politically... He, he, they're making fun of us right now. Oh, well, they should. Yeah, they should. Yeah, they should. it's embarrassing. Embarrassing. So Okay, so you want to throw out the charts? Yeah, I'll throw out some charts. I'll kind of give a little uh, pre-frame here. So the, the narrative, or not the narrative, but the coaching that was going on is we were talking about uh, his own his own investments and how he's diversifying. And I, I threw out that it's valuable to put some money in silver and gold. And he couldn't quite understand that. Uh, he's been trading crypto for a long time, and he understands that crypto has a limited supply, whereas fiat does not. But he never understood some of these things. And as we got to the end of that conversation, he pointed out some stuff he never understood. And this is a very intelligent man who knows economics very well, has a master's in economics. And he didn't understand what we talked about. He'd never known that before. So I thought I would share some of this. If you can see my screen here, what you're looking at is you're looking at a chart of the U.S. dollar index. So if you happen to go to a charting um Company. This is a software called TradingView. You can go to tradingview.com. You can see these charts for free. So you might throw that in your links down there, tradingview.com. And this is ticker symbol DXY. And what that is, is it's a dollar index, just like the Dow Jones Industrial or the S&P. It's an index, a summation of a whole lot of stuff related to the U.S. dollar. Now, this particular index is the U.S. dollar versus a basket of currencies, and that is going to be the euro, the Canadian dollar, uh, the, the British pound, um, the Aussie dollar, the New Zealand dollar. I think probably the Singapore dollars in there. I'm not sure what all's in there. There's, you know, there's a handful of other currencies. So when we look at this, and this is what's really important for people to understand. When we look at this chart, you're not just looking at the value of the dollar, but you're looking at the value of the dollar relative to all these other currencies. And so I want to go back and we'll just kind of, we can create the conversation here. I don't have a specific, um, you know, outline to teach you through, but this is the current value of the dollar index. It's about 98. And I want to show you going back in time here, if you can see this, um, on the far left of the screen, this is the US dollar relative to all the other basket of currencies was ranked, was um, reading about 120 on the index in the year 2000, 2001, 2002, <coughs> when George Bush, George W. Bush took office, right. okay? 
Now, over his entire reign as presidency, you can see the value of the dollar plummeted. And a lot of people didn't realize this was happening under, under W, but under W, the value of the dollar just really went down relative to world currencies. And when we got to the bottom in 2008, this is when Obama took over. The first thing that happened is they kind of stabilized the economy. People don't realize this happened. I'm going to draw some interesting things on the chart here. This was after the crash. Uh, this was actually the crash, excuse me, the, right. the leading up to the market crash. And then what we saw was the deflation kicking in at incredible levels. Now, before I get there, let me just help you understand. When you see the dollar value going down like this, it means that the dollar is becoming worth less. Okay, so the dollar is worth less relative to other currencies. When we see this first spike here, this was actually the uh, so-called market crash. I'll right. try to write this up here. Because what really happened, and I'll show you this on some Fed charts in a minute. I'm going to hover over this and you're going to see the dates. That crash started on August, 8, uh, August 11th of 2008. And it went all the way through, it peaked February of 2009. Now, if you know your stock market history, was February it, 2009 was, it, was the bottom of the market. Okay, I thought it was June of 2009. Was that why well, I'm wrong on that? Or It was February of 2009, yeah. Really? Wow, okay. Yeah, yeah. So here's the interesting thing. This bullish move on the US dollar was the bearish move in the stock market. Now, people, they have that backwards a lot of time. They're thinking, well, right. the dollar was going down. No, it was actually the opposite. The dollar started going down. You ready for this? That dollar crash was QE1. That dollar crash was QE2. This mm. was QE infinity. And this is when it all stopped. So what's really been happening over the last 10, 12 years has actually been a deflation where asset prices were in many ways actually coming down. And we saw this starting in 2008 where the housing crash and all that stuff was happening because we were deflating. There was all that mortgage crisis and all the, the foreclosures. What that did is it sucked money supply out. Now, I'm gonna show you a couple of things on this chart and then I'll show you in the Fed charts how some of this stuff relates. Just for your own reference, let's go back in time a little bit. This was the 1980s wow. and this... In this the, is where we were during the entire 1980s. We actually peaked, like I said, with George Bush in office. This was the 80s. This was 1984, 1985, this peak. I'll have to scale the chart a little bit. So this was when Reagan was in office. The dollar index was so valuable. In 1985, we ranked it at 163 on the dollar index. Wow. Pretty incredible. And then you look, this is also interesting, going back to the 70s, um, this is when Richard Nixon took us off the, the gold standard. Now you say, why is it moving here? It's moving because other currencies were moving. Okay, right. Remember, this is not relative to gold. This is relative to other currencies. And other currencies were moving, so it was moving down. But during the 1980s, the U.S. dollar was the strongest it's ever been in 1985. Right. So some pretty interesting stuff there. Now, there's more to share coming back to the current millennium. Uh, any questions on that before I move on? No, I mean, I just think it's fascinating. Um, you know, it's, it's an inverse relationship because, and that's the same thing that happens too. Bond market, you know, is is part of the, the currency. Am I correct on that when I say the fiat has a relation to the bond or is it opposite relationship? Well, the reason bonds have an opposite relation is because they're considered a discount instrument. Okay. So they you, you take the discount up front. If you have a thousand dollar bond with a 5%, um, interest rate paid over whatever time frame, they'll sell it to you for five percent less, but they pay you back the full value. So it's a oh, discount. Okay, gotcha. So if bond, if if interest rates go up, bond prices go down, and then you get paid back the full amount okay. because it's an inverse relationship. Yeah. Wow. So let me show you on this chart a couple of things, and we'll just kind of start, you know, working through some of the things that have happened. The first thing that I think should come through people's minds is if you look at this chart, it looks like the U.S. dollar is pretty stable. Hmm, yeah. Relatively speaking, from 2008 to current time, if I just draw the chart, we have this little price range right here that the dollar has fluctuated in. And in reality, the dollar is more valuable today than it was when Obama was, was in power. Hmm. But here's the thing people don't understand. That's relative. 
that's relative to other fiat currencies, relative to the euro, Got it. relative to the pound, relative to the yen, et cetera. Okay. Now I'm going to pull up another chart, and this is going to be a chart of gold. And this is spot gold going back in time. And we're going to go back to 1971. Look how valuable gold was. Wow. You can see it, mid-30s here, roughly $36 an ounce in 1971 until Richard Nixon took over. And that's when they spiked the gold. But, you know, I mean, no, no, the official point is 1933, we go off the pure gold standard where they pull the gold back in. But in 1971, they were, they were killing gold. Uh, they, they were killing gold in the trading from the fiat, from other fiats. So, I mean, I know. What well, I know. okay. Let's, let's help people unpack that. You'll notice that the price is a line. It's a flat line because it was a fixed value. So if you look at the bottom here, which is gonna be hard to see, this goes back to 1834 to, to the 1930s. Uh, that's the date that I just circled there at the bottom. I should get rid of these indicators. That's Sorry right. about that. Um, so these dates at the bottom, it shows that the price was in the mid twenties. Uh, I don't have an exact price in there cause it was, there's a little 20, spread so it fluctuates. A, I mean, when, when uh, FDR did, it was $20 and 60 cents. When yes. he, was, he was trading it in. Yeah, so I'm getting 2077. So that's there's a little spread happening, but that's all right. Um, and then right here in 1930, suddenly the price jumps up to 2254, suddenly jumps up to 2647, and then we're suddenly stabilized up here at, at about 35. Right. Okay. And it stays there. And what happened in the 1940s, I think it was 1944, if I have my date right. You can kind of see my cursor across right. the screen there. Um, this there was a an agreement called the Bretton Woods Agreement, and you guys can I mean your your listeners can look this up. Right. This is not secret. And the Bretton Woods Agreement basically what they did is all the international currencies after World War II said we can't keep storing gold. We're going to peg our currency to the U.S. dollar. The U.S. dollar is pegged to gold. And since the U.S. dollar is pegged a value, it will become the new world reserve currency. Wow. Okay. So the dollars that we have, if you have a dollar in front of you, or I happen to have $20, it's about as rich as I am now. Right. Uh, I don't have a dime, so either way. Yeah. So this, <laughs> if you go back to the history of money, this was in like in kindness of, if you go back, to, like, let's say, let's just do this kind of in real rudimentary terms. Money, money only came about because there was value to trade. If you go back and you look at the Japanese trading history, they were actually trading rice because it was something people could produce. It was a consumable. It was, there was value to it. And so if somebody needed new shoes for the kids and they would give them rice, well, you can imagine how easy it is to spill your rice everywhere. One of the first exchanges was the rice futures exchange in Japan, where they actually had pieces of paper. They had a rice bank. You would take your rice to the bank. You would deposit it. They get a piece of paper that says this piece of paper, this certificate is worth one bushel of rice or whatever. And instead of trading rice, they traded paper that was backed by rice. Wow. Okay. In the U.S. Constitution, it flat out says, I forget the article, but, but you can look it up or one of your listeners can, this silver is required. Our currency article, has to be backed by silver. Article um, 1, uh, Section 10. That's right. You're probably right on the number. I don't know. But this piece of paper, this, this one here is a Federal Reserve note, but the original notes that we had in the United States, they had right. to be backed by gold and silver. Right. And the original paper money that we had in the United States, if you go back to the, the founding of the country, they tried a national bank that didn't even last like three months. And um, every state bank would issue their own paper because what they were really doing is it was a receipt. It was a paper receipt that said, this is an exchange for X ounces of gold or X ounces of silver. Then we went through this period where we had a couple of national banks in the United States and eventually the Federal Reserve, they pegged the US dollar this, the Federal Reserve note US dollar to gold. FDR needed some more money. So the way they stole that from the people was they devalued gold from 20 an ounce to 35 an ounce. 
And then they reissued it and they said, okay, now you can come back and you can get your gold again, but it's going to cost you $35 an ounce to get your ounce of gold. Right. Right. But at least we were still pegged. There was a value that was there until, as you can see on the chart, 1971. And what Richard Nixon did without the approval of Congress, without the approval of the American people, is he took us off the gold standard. But it wasn't just the United States. It was every other country around the world. But part of that was a false flag event when they when they were screwing with the uh, the petrodollar, or they're creating the petrodollar, and we had those massive gas lines. So you know that it's fascinating that the 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 Fed does this. They did this, you know, in 1913 around the Titanic, you know, issues. We have we have other kinds of of false flag events. 1929 was a huge false flag. But in the in the uh, you're talking about 1971 when Nixon Nixon and by the way uh, Nixon was an actor if you don't know his his little backstory he was an actor picked by Joseph uh, uh, Kennedy so JFK's <laughs> dad had picked him out and had one had groomed him to be that one of those presidents and it's fascinating I did not know that. They were they worked against each other, but but they were supposed to you know it was supposed to be the way that JFK got into office, but um, in the '60 election when that was really hotly hotly contested, uh, JFK won by the mafia getting him in in the Chicago area. So right. and then later on, obviously JFK I mean uh, sorry uh, Nixon gets into office because he became that that uh, Joseph uh, P. Kennedy's uh, crony in essence. So there's right. a cabal e exit, you know, with that too. So, yeah. Yeah. So this is the history of your dollar. I mean, people don't realize this is what happened to our money over time. And this was over a hundred years ago now. I mean, it was in the 1920s when we were $20 an ounce. And wow. not quite a hundred years ago that all this happened, but uh, 1930, 536, wherever it was in there. 1944, that was the year for Bretton Woods. That's when the international countries used the US dollar. So now what they said is this currency from whatever country is worth X US dollars. The US dollar is worth X silver and gold. So they were still backed, international currencies were backed by gold and silver as a as proxy, basically, you know, via the US dollar. Right. And today, a lot of people don't realize it, but a lot of countries like my client over in the UAE, uh, their money is pegged to the U.S. dollar. The Iraqi dinar today is pegged to the U.S. dollar. The Kuwaiti right. dinar is pegged to the U.S. dollar. It doesn't float freely like the euro and like the pound and these other currencies. They're pegged to the U.S. dollar. Oh, I get you. Wow, I didn't know that. Okay. Learn something every day. Guys, this is why I bring some, like Jeremy on. I'm like, you know, I, I know some of this stuff, but man, I don't know this all this stuff. I love it. Great. Yeah, so if, if you go trade, and I can pull up some of these charts, if you look at the euro against the US dollar, it's constantly fluctuating, but you, you look at some of those other countries, and, you know, that's part of what the cabal has done is they've devalued a lot of these countries. Right. Kuwait, you know, Kuwait was the one that they revalued up, but most of them they revalued down. And so I have this Zimbabwe note here. Um, this is a $50 trillion note. This is probably what the U.S. dollar should be worth. <laughs> exactly right now. <laughs> it should not be worth what we're seeing. And I'm going to show you that here. But let's just go on down the, the journey here. So in 1971, Nixon took us off the gold standard. And here's where we went over the next six years. Wow. By 1975, excuse me, next five, four years. Uh, so we went from $36 an ounce of gold 195 amazing to 195 wow in four years wow I for didn't... those for those of your uh, listeners or viewers who have a hard time knowing what that translates to you take 195 you subtract 36 that's a difference of 159 we divide 159 by 36 that's 441 percent see and and how much money they were making because this is this is how these guys like doing it. I mean, they love to like make money off of your back because they had, yeah. I mean, part of the part point that we were talking about here is FDR was taking the gold so that they could, you know, they could create their own standards. But, you know, uh, 
Nixon was was moving it moving the ball forward with that too. Yes. Now here's the reason this is interesting. A lot of people think that gold and silver, um, that they're going up in value, and they're not. You need to know no, gold and no, silver not. do not go up in value. Okay. This go this silver coin is always worth this silver coin. One ounce of silver is always worth one ounce of silver. So here's something I did with my kids. I took this, this thing of silver and I actually only had 25 coins, but I laid it out on the floor. And I said, if you add five more to it, it's 30 pieces of silver. That's what Judas betrayed Jesus for. Wow. So th- here's an interesting, interesting side note today. What's the value of silver today? It's about 30, $34, maybe $33. No, it just went back. Uh, no, I thought it was uh, silver. I thought it was like 27 yeah, I'm sorry. I'm thinking the American Eagles are $34 yeah. today. It's the uh, silver today was about 25, 26. So, yeah. so let's just go $25 times 30 pieces of silver. Judas betrayed Jesus for the equivalent of $750 today. Isn't that amazing? It's stunning. I mean, that it's, yeah, it's not even that much money. And that's why that, that, you know, he just dropped it in the piece of land. He didn't drop like millions of dollars or some other kind of crazy kind of idea. Uh, with that too so wow. one of the best objects lessons you need to get you 30 pieces of silver because you should just have it in your safe but you need it because it's the best bible lesson ever for how little judas betrayed jesus for because 30 ounces of silver in the year zero is worth 30 ounces of silver today wow okay i have a question for you I want to back you up a hair yeah so if you're talking about 1975 and we're talking about 195 in the gold value point. Um, Watergate hits around 75 too. Am I am I wrong or? Well, I wasn't born until 77, so I'm going to have to go on your memory for that. Okay, I mean I'm I'm you know around that same time because Nixon Nixon jumps out. We have Ford taking over. Uh, what's the Ford takes over in 74, and Nixon. And so Nixon was out in 74, 74 to 76 is, is Ford. So, you know, I'm wondering if there's a, if there's a time frame around 74, wow, in 74, it went up massively too. Yeah, it, because it wasn't just what Nixon was doing. What was happening is in that, the real inflation that happened, here's what you have to understand. When this happened, it's not, that gold or silver was becoming more valuable. It's the the dollar was becoming less valuable. The reason we had inflation in the seventies was not related to oil. It was related to this right here. The dollar was becoming that less valuable, but here's the crazy thing. You ready? I'm going to pull this other chart up. We're going to put these next to each other right here at the peak. You can see my crosshair is lined up on the left side as well. Wow. Can you see that? Yeah. The dollar was going down in value. Because gold was going up. Because gold was going up. But you'll notice it wasn't going down as much. Right. Why? Because this dollar index is not tied to gold. This dollar index is tied to other fiat currencies. Which is part, so this of, is part, of, in, part of a deflation, you know, a conversation, right? Or no, this, well, this, is part of, this is part of the understanding of fiat currency. So right. if, if gold is four times more than the dollar is one fourth is valuable, right. but why is it not one fourth as valuable on that chart with the, with the other side over here? And the answer is because this, oh shoot, that's the wrong one. What did I click? This, um, this chart for the dollar is not uh-huh. relative to gold. It's relative to euros and, and Canadian dollars and Australian dollars, which are also fiat. Right, right. So let me show you the rest of this journey, and then we'll, we'll have a lot to dissect after I go through the rest of this. So moving forward, this was the 1980s. Uh, gold hit a value, a peak value in um, 1980, June 21st, 1980, of $875 an ounce. So I do remember in less time. than 10 years, less than 10 years under the Nixon and Ford 1970s and Carter administration, during that time frame, gold went from thirty-six dollars an ounce in nineteen seventy-one to eight hundred and seventy-five dollars an ounce in less than ten years. That is why we had runaway inflation in the seventies. Oh man! And that also 
is part of the the petrodollar conversation and gas prices and we couldn't get gas in 71 too and i mean well actually so the petrodollar here's the thing about petrodollar the petrodollar what the cabal has tried to do is move us from solid sound money because there's a finite amount of this to something they can produce more of which is oil and so the petrodollar, by getting us off of gold and silver and moving us over to petrodollar, they have the ability to pump more oil, which means they can pump more money. Right. Every one of the Middle East wars has really been about oil. It's been about yeah. owning the, the black gold fields. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's that, that was the point of the 2003 Iraqi war. That was the point of the 91, you know, Iraqi war. I mean, it was all about that stuff. Right? Yeah. Every, every one of them. Yep. It's funny that those two wars happened under Bush, Poppy Bush and, and Bush W. I mean, or W in that way. So I, I have a prophetic friend who's actually tied in with, with your school there, ORU. Uh -huh. And in 2005, 2006, uh, I was in Estes Park, Colorado with her. And she recounted a story in the late 90s. She was serving at a political dinner where Poppy Bush and Cheney and a bunch of other of that organization were talking about how um, the Iraq situation had fallen apart. And she heard it said, and she quoted this to me in, in I think it was 2005, 2006. She, she had overheard this full conversation of them saying, don't worry, we're going to get um, Bush's boy in there and he's going to fix everything for us. Right. I mean, and she knew this. She knew this two years before it was going to happen. Guys, you don't catch, I mean, we talk about Democrat, Republican, and do all this other silliness. They're all part of it. I mean, I, I personally, I personally have seen. There's a hearing aid manufacturer. I don't want to say their name, but a hearing aid manufacturer that um, brings these guys together. And do you know Bush and Clinton, who were hardened um, anti each other. I mean, not friends at that time frame. Were um, were pushing this thing, and they're they're like best buddies. Um, you know, they're all a part of that group and it's a sickness. It is. All right. So moving on through history, we're in the 1980s now. Here's where gold went. We actually had a major deflationary time period where gold dropped down to only $300 an ounce during the 80s, first couple of years. But what else happened in the first couple of years of Reagan's presidency? Do you remember what happened to the dollar? It, it increased. It became the most valuable it's ever been. So during that period of the early 80s, when Reagan was president, look what was happening to gold. It was going down. Now, it's not because gold was going, losing value. It's because the dollar was becoming so much more valuable. Just relative to world currencies from 1980 to 1985, the U.S. dollar double, doubled relative to global currencies. So you were looking for the economic ability of the fiat at that time. Yeah, I mean, that just, just, yeah, I mean, I don't know if it even has anything to do with what we were looking for. This is just kind of a history lesson of what oh, happened. Yeah, and you can see what happened to the to the gold standard or, or to the value of gold. Now, as I move forward, uh, oops, I'm back on the dollar. Let's go back to gold. As I move forward here through time, gold stayed relatively inexpensive through the 80s and 90s. And the big one, and this is one that's just going to shock you. Uh, we had a pretty big sell-off here in the late 90s, early 2000s. Where was the other time that gold, that the dollar was the most valuable relative to, to global currencies? 99, 2000, 2000, 2000, 2001, 2002. And by the way, most people don't remember that time frame pre-9-11 because, I mean, my stock market things were getting killed. I mean, yeah. I was I was putting in, at the time in my simple IRA, like 400 bucks a month. And I was losing 550. I mean, it was ugliness. And I didn't know enough about what I didn't know on that one. And I was getting kicked, you know, I mean, in, in the side every moment with that. I do remember that. Yeah. I can help you with that. You never need to have that pain again. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, that's something that I promise you we're, we're all going to be. And by the way, guess what, guys, why are we doing this? You need to learn about money. It cannot be like this ugly subject that you only let, you know, uh, smart people that are smarter than you. I get it. You, you know, you need to have people like Jeremy, but you need to invest your mind in this stuff. Let me tell you that if I can go on a tangent here, Please. here's the fallacy 
of personal finance and investment. The fallacy is that you need a professional to manage your money. Here's the statistics. I don't have it to show you right here, but I can show you. I can back this up. According to the S&P's research, and they put out a report every year called the SPIVA study, and they study all the different S&P 500, well, all the S&P indices. So they have the small cap index, the S&P 500, all those different S&P indices. And over a, if you look at the stats, over about a one-year period of time, 70% of professional fund managers cannot match or beat the relative index. Right. I'm, I'm rounding these numbers, but I'm within one or two percent at some point. Right. It's roughly 70, 72% cannot match the S&P index. Now, you would think over time it would get better because that's what all the professionals tell you. They say, invest for the long haul, haul leave it in there for five years, 10 years, 15 years before you're going to see any results, right? right? Well, over three years, the numbers get worse. Over three years, it's more like 76% of professional fund managers cannot match or beat the S&P 500. And you say, well, over time, it's going to get better. Five years, it gets over 80%. Over 10, 15 years, it goes even more. By the time you get out to 15 to 20 years, it's over 93% of fund managers cannot match or beat the S&P 500. The average individual would be better served to take all their money away from their fund managers, get their own IRA or 401k, whatever format they want to put it in, get their own little trading account with Schwab or TradeStation or whoever, and just simply buy SPY ETF, which is an exchange traded fund, trades the S&P 500. It's always 100% exactly the S&P. They would, individuals would be better served to buy that and hold it for 20 years. They will beat 90 plus percent of the so-called professional fund managers. The only way to beat the market with a fund manager, a professional, is to have a top 5% fund manager. And they're not going to talk to most people because most people don't have enough money to talk to them. Wow. So that is the huge fallacy. And then there's other fallacies that they've taught, especially since the Great Depression, um, that you can only make money when the market goes up. That's a fallacy. In fact, the short side, the bearish side of the market is one of the things that keeps the market free. It keeps it stable. Right. There's so many fallacies that they've taught over the years. They taught people to buy mutual funds. One of the worst investments you can get into is mutual funds. Uh, there's just so many things that they keep telling people, this is what you need to do. This is what you need to do. And it's just not true. They tell people they can't time the market. Well, I'm living proof that that's a flat out lie because I've taught thousands of people how to time the market with very simple techniques, techniques that professional fund managers also could know, but they choose not to because they choose to make it really complicated and make it complicated for people. So they think they have to have them. It's just not true. You don't need the professionals, but people have to have the courage to go learn. People have yeah. this belief that they can't do it, but they can, and they can do it relatively simply. And, and this is, this is part of my point. And this is the value of, of listening to what, what Jeremy's talking about guys. You know, we, we need people that, that kind of are, are, some people call it, and I want to, I don't want to get off on the new age idea of this, but 5d thinking in essence that's what he's doing he's doing next level thinking beyond uh nasara too and i know he's not beyond nasara the second but he's thinking that way as well and and i know that and and that comes from hearing wisdom not just knowledge but wisdom in there too so that's kind of cool yeah i just want you know part of my mission i mean i've been teaching trading for since 2008, since this right here, the way I got into trading was right here when the market was collapsing. This is gold. So gold's going up, but you come back over it. Well, I have to go to another chart to show you the Dow, but uh, when the market oh, yeah. was collapsing, was 60%, yeah. Um, you know, we were making money and we had friends and family that were freaking out. We're like, well, how can you not make money? It's easy. And so we started teaching them. And that was how I got into teaching trading because I realized that people were just following, literally following who they were told to follow right off the cliff. Right. And there was no reason because every warning, just like right now, the current market, I mean, we've been anticipating where we are right now since November and all of my students were prepared for it because it's obvious if you know what you're looking at and right. you don't have to, you don't have to short the market. You don't have to do risky stuff. You just need to protect yourself. Right. But if people are listening to the TV and they're listening to the so-called professionals, they're going to get the bad advice. Right. And, and here's the problem. Those boys that are given those bad advice, they're part of that cabal kind of thing. And they're, they are, take your money. they are. So let me show you where this gets really scary. You ready for this? Yeah. This was the move from 2000 to 2008. So in the year 2000, when Bush took office to the year 2008, this was before the so-called crash. 
This was in March of 2008. The big crash, now the market had already started to roll over, but the news picked up on it July and August and September of 2008. This peak, gold had already risen to $1,000 an ounce before Obama ever took office. Hmm. People don't realize what was happening. Wow. Gold had already gone from 250 an ounce whenever Bush took office to 1,000. That's a four times devaluation of your money. And it was also obvious, ready for this? It was also obvious if somebody's looking at the chart of the dollar index, because during that time frame, from 2001, 2000, 2001, to the so bottom in 2008, that? that's what happened to the dollar. And guess what? I hate to be weird about this, but you know we are going to all learn about 9/11 and really what this puppy was about, because German, I know, I know he believes this too, but there were nefarious issues related to Nasara and related to the gold issues that were in those buildings. And yeah, this was their dream and their 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 response to it. Yeah, that's. That's exactly it. So now I'm going to show you some really freaky stuff, okay? And this is the thing that should really alarm everybody because we could be on the precipice of a dollar collapse like we've never imagined before. Um, this was, I'm going, to, I'm going to kind of draw arrows because people won't see and they won't be able to see the dates, but this is sure. 2000, this is the bottom. Okay, let me cl be clear. This is the bottom of the dollar sell-off in 2008, but the time frame for that is the beginning of the market crash. So just keep that out there. Th this was when the stock market was about to collapse because the dollar got really strong here. You say, why'd the dollar get strong right there? Well, at this time, we use this term in a video that you and I did. Can't remember if we published that one or not. Did in the first, first video that we published, did we talk about collateralized assets? Yeah. So for your viewers who may not know what that means, when you go and buy a house, let's say your house is $500,000 and you only have 20,000. So you put down 20,000 as a deposit and the bank gives you the rest of it, the 480,000 as a loan. Okay, what they did is they gave you the buying power for $500,000 house. You didn't have that money. Where'd that money come from? You say, oh, they, they took it from the bank. No, they didn't. They took it out of thin air from the bank based on what we call fractional reserve lending. And that house is what we call a collateralized asset. It's an asset on your books. It's also an asset on the bank's books. The bank's book, and sure. it's held by collateral by your deed. And that $480,000 that you've just pledged to pay off over the next 500 million years, um, that is your asset that you're paying on forever. Okay. Now, here's some weird numbers. You ready for this? In 2008, what we call M1 money supply was about four to five trillion dollars, US dollars. That is this. They had about four to five trillion of these printed. However, those four to five trillion deposited into the bank through fractional reserve lending collateralized 800 trillion dollars worth of assets. And that's why portions of, of the market were, were, were crashing because they wanted to take the assets out. You ready for this, Scott? <laughs> Between the beginning of the crash and the end, that number went down to 400 trillion. That's how much they wrote down the collateralized debts. But it doesn't mean that they went away. They wrote it off with that. They wrote it off. Debt. That wealth disappeared as far as they're concerned. And there, it was actually healthy for the economy because what it did for the economy is it flushed out a whole bunch of fake money. But that's why you see the dollar becoming more valuable right here because the market, the debt bubble was collapsing and it collapsed right. in half. Now, I, I sh I'm going to change my pen color to mark these things. And I'm going to show you this on another chart in a second. QE1, QE2, this was, when it stabilized here, this was QE infinity, we'll just call it three, and this is when QE ended. What happened when QE ended? The dollar got stronger. Why did 
with each of these QEs, this was the injection of currency. It was about six or 700 billion for each right. of them. And notice what happened. The second QE one stopped, the dollar went up. So they had to do QE two. Notice what happened. Soon as it stopped, the dollar went up. And then QE infinity, it stabilized because instead of doing a sudden injection, they did it, they dripped it out with no end until they finally ended it three or four years later. Does that make sense? So what they yeah. did is they, and Ben Bernanke was saying this the whole time. This was Operation Twist, okay? There's, there's some cabal language. Operation Twist is what the Fed called it, where they were manipulating the value of the currency so it didn't look like we were deflating, but we were deflating. Wow. So to offset deflation, how do you do it? You have to inject currency. So what was QE1? It was printing of 600 and some odd billion dollars to inflate the currency. QE2, more printing of currency, more printing. But the Fed can't print currency, only the treasury can. So what are they doing? They're writing more debt. So when someone says, well, that must've worked because the economy has been great. Here's the part that's gonna make everybody soil their pants. You ready for this? Since this time, the US dollar has been stable, right? Wrong. This is the U.S. dollar. The dollar index is the U.S. dollar relative to other currencies. Correct. Since this time, oops, I pulled up the same chart. Forgive me. Since this time, gold has gone from when Bush took office, 250 an ounce, 2008, it was 1,000 an ounce. We're at 2,000 an ounce now. So you say, oh, okay, well, the dollar is just devalued in half again. Come on, pen. <laughs> just not like it. There we go. So now, as of right now, the dollar is about 2,000 an ounce, or excuse me, gold is 2,000 an ounce. Right. Okay. Now, remember, gold did not become more valuable. Gold is always the same value. Right. One ounce of gold is always worth an ounce of gold. You say, well, that doesn't match up because the dollar didn't become worth half as much because they're playing with it. And they're there's playing the with manipulation it. with that too. They're manipulating it. So it feels like it looks like things didn't happen. But what are we seeing? Inflation is going up. How much is your gas now? How much, your, how much is your food? Inflation okay. is going up. Now you're ready for the scary part? I'm going to pull this number up. First of all, the Fed stopped counting M1 money supply. They changed the definition in 2020. Up until 2020, the definition was currency that was in circulation. And they created a new one. M1 money supply is now currency in circulation plus deposits, first level of deposits. And if you look at this chart, this is a Fed chart. You will see in 2020, over one month, M1 money supply went from 4.7 trillion to 16 trillion. They didn't print $16 trillion. They changed the definition. That's why in one month, from point to point, the, <laughs> the amount of M1 money supply suddenly quadrupled. It didn't. Okay. They changed the definition. <laughs> and it gets worse. <laughs> you ready for this one? This is the Fed. You can read this here. This is, the, this is published data, hidden in plain sight. Look over here, not over there. Well, over there, this is what they're telling you. Collateralization of currency holdings against the Federal Reserve notes. See this right here? Right. This is collateralized assets. 2008, look what happened. I'm gonna hover over it. At the beginning of 2008 crisis, it was almost 800 trillion. At the because end- they were writing it off. There's your- At the there's end, your it hundred. was 400 trillion. There's where I come up with my numbers. I didn't right. make this stuff up. Look where we are today. 2.2 quadrillion. 2.2 quadrillion is the number today. However, you saw it in the charts. They have devalued based on collateralized assets. They have, you know, here's why this is important. What collateralized assets is, is that has the impact to the economy of infiltrating, injecting 2.2 quadrillion dollars. Oh. But you don't see it here in the dollar index. And you don't see it in gold. We see half of it in gold. See, gold and silver are heavily manipulated, but we do see half of it in gold. From 2008 to 2022, gold doubled in price instead of tripled. So it's, it's, 
suppress, the fair value of gold, if we were ranking it like we did in 2008, should be 3,000 an ounce. That or would more. be the fair value. Oh, really? 3,000, would you put it higher than that? Maybe, but if you just go with, if we use the money supply issues from collateralized assets, you say it was 800 trillion in 2008, and now there's 2.2 quadrillion, so that's roughly three times as much. So we should be three times the gold value today. Wow. Okay, now here's what we're going to do, guys. I know you're interested in that. We're going to break this up into se segments, okay? And we're going to have him, uh, we're going to do this back here. So uh, flip back here. Let's see how we get back in there. Um, so we're going to we're gonna break this up into segments so you guys can uh, help. Hold on, sorry. Oh, there we go. Stop sharing? No, yeah, I, I already did it for you. So Here's what, we're going we're gonna to come back and talk about this because what I want Jeremy to talk about in the next one episode that we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about what 2020 on is really doing in relation to the Fed and the money supply with that too. Okay? So thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to us. Yeah.